Welcome to the online worship service of First United Methodist Church in Lincolnton, North Carolina. On behalf of the whole church, we want to welcome you as we worship and praise Jesus Christ together. I'm Tim Roberts and I'm the pastor here. And if you would like to know more about what's going on here at First Church, I invite you to take a look at the links below in the comment section and uh, click on those and you'll be able to access the, today's bulletin, the GPS, our guide to prayer and scripture, announcements, and of course a place for you to uh, click to make a, your donation of your tithe and offering to First Church. Well, brothers and sisters, as we gather together from near and far at different times this week, we welcome you and we welcome God into this place, into your homes and into our hearts. Let's go to God in prayer. Oh, gracious God, as we gather, we come together to worship you and to praise you because, Father, you are worthy. You are the creator. You are the sustainer. You are the maker. You're the redeemer. And God, you glory in your children. And so we pray, God, that all that we do today will be pleasing to you. And be honored today, Father, for your children have come to worship. Amen. As we prepare for this time of reflection, I want to ask you to do something. I want you to imagine that, that you're looking at your life with such detail that when you put ink to it, hundreds of thousands of people will clamor to read it. it sounds pretty exciting, doesn't it? Now imagine that while you engage your mastery of literary prose so to try to conceal the identities of other people in your life story. You describe your life's events so vividly that, that many of the people that you included have recognized themselves and they were less than flattered. Well, you know, that's exactly what happened to a young writer from Asheville named Thomas Wolfe when he wrote his autobiography as a novel called Look Homeward Angel. It seems that some 200 citizens of our state's famed western town were none too happy with how they were portrayed. As a matter of fact, their ire was so intense that, that Wolfe, he wouldn't return home for several years. But instead, he drew from this experience, and he wrote another novel to capture this quandary that he was now in uh, called You Can't Go Home Again. Now, have you ever felt like that? 
that, have you ever felt that for whatever reason, you just can't go home again? What I want us to wrestle with that feeling for just a little bit as we take some time to reflect on Scripture and on God speaking to us today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. And, and I invite you to do the prayer that we've been doing since I've been with you. As we hold our hands out, palms up, as we assume this, pa- uh, this posture of expectancy and pray this prayer with me. Lord, I offer myself to you. Open my ears to hear and my heart to receive all you have for me today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's been some years ago that uh, my family, when I first started in ministry, we had, we had been appointed to a, uh, a three-point charge up in Hamptonville. Uh, if you don't know where Hamptonville is, it's basically where 421 and I-77 cross. And it's, it's really the middle of an Amish community. Uh, being such, the, the closest town was the town of Yadkinville, and that's where we would sometimes have to go to eat. And um, I, I remember going to the, the local seafood place there one time, and we had just finished eating, and, my, and I was, uh, was up at the cashier station, and, and my daughters were, had been right behind me, and they were, I think, uh, about two and four at the, at the time. And I remember as I was paying the cashier, I saw this small hand come up and get a mint from the tray. And, and, uh, and I looked back and it was my daughters and they had each got a mint and uh, they were eating. And so I was kept paying and then I saw this hand come up again. And I'm thinking, that's enough. And so I turned and I slapped the hand. And it was about that time that whenever I, I turned to look and scold one of my daughters that I noticed that it was an, it was an elderly lady. And she said, I, I just needed to get one. <laughs> I mean, I was so embarrassed, I just picked the whole thing up and I said, here, just take them all. You know, it, it, it's easy whenever we're preoccupied with other thoughts that we mistake someone's identity. And did you know that it's really just as easy to mistake or even lose our own identity? Actually, we see that in the scripture that we've been using for this series that we conclude today uh, called um, Finding Your Way Back Home. And this series has been based on the story of the prodigal son. And it's a story that I'm sure you know well. But let's go back and hear it again. And I'll I'll tell the whole story up to the point of today's scripture verse. And it begins like this. Now Jesus was was telling this, uh, was was talking to uh, his disciples at this time, and he continued by saying, There was a man who had two sons. The young one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So the man divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, and he set out for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. 
I will set out and I will go back to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. During this, the course of this story, the, this young man goes through some eye-opening experiences, what I've been referring to as awakenings. The first one was that he awakened to a, a longing that he had. He, he longed for something more. He had, he had this longing for, for something else out there, for maybe some, uh, something else or some unrequited love. And so he went off to look for it. The second awakening was when he got to a point that he wished he could start over. That he came to his senses and regretted what he had done. And last week we talked about another awakening. It was the awakening that he could not rectify his problems on his own, that he needed help from someone else. And today we come to our fourth awakening. And that is, well, we'll get to, oh, we'll discover it together. You know, as this young man came back home, he realized something. He realized that as he returned to the geographical area that he called home, he realized that the journey wasn't open. I mean, it wasn't over. That it was really something that he was going to have to do over and over again. And, and I believe that we've come to understand this as well, that these awakenings are not one-stop fixes. And just because we are home doesn't mean everything is fixed. Because a lot of times when we come home, we have still forgotten who we are and where we belong. The story continues on in Luke chapter 15, verses 20. It says this, it says, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and filled with compassion. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. And this is where our, our story picks up today. Verse 21, where it says this. The son said to him, Father, well, well, hold on just a minute. I mean, do we see what's happening here? I mean, I can imagine this, this young man coming in and his father seeing him and running out, you know, put, just being totally undignified as he ran to his son and he, he embraced him and you could just imagine his father crying. But the young man still wasn't understanding. He had seen his father running to him, something that he could have never imagined his father doing. And he felt his warm embrace and he saw the tears flowing down his, eyes, I mean, his father's face. And although he had witnessed all of these acts of grace, he still wasn't able to, to understand and to grasp his real identity, his new identity. So he begins saying, Father. Now, have you ever been like that? Have you ever been to the point that despite all of the love and grace that somebody is is it's offering you. You just can't get your brain wrapped around it. You feel like that you have to fix it. And the only way you could do it right here is to, is to make amends. And, and, and you know what that's called? 
It's called shame. And it, and it casts a cloud of gloom on our home, homecoming, and it whispers in our ears, you don't deserve what you're getting. So it keeps you blind to your real identity. And this is what was happening to this young man. He, he said, Father, I've, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And I can imagine what happened next. While his son would just said those words, I can imagine the, the father putting his, his fingers to his son's mouth and, and, and waving them off and, and turning as he continues uh, in the scripture. This, But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and, and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and, and, and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost. And now he's found. So they began to celebrate. You know, we, we, as we read this story, there's something that sticks out to us. The father said, this son of mine who was lost is found. Now, this was not the, the only time that the hearers of this story, they, these first hearers, was going to be exposed to this notion of lostness. Jesus also, within this same time period, tells of the parable of the lost sheep. You know where the, the, the shepherd leaves the 99 to go find that one lost one. He also tells the story of the lost coin who the woman searches frantically until she finds that lost coin that, that was so precious. And so they begin to understand Oh my gosh, what is Jesus trying to tell us about, about a God who loves something so much that he will do anything to go anywhere to find what is lost? And once it's found, you know, it doesn't say that the Father stopped him from making these amends and saying, you bad boy, why did you do this to me? No, he wanted to celebrate because what was lost was found, what was, had been considered dead was alive again. And he turned to his servants and he said, quick, let's party. Bring out the robe and put on my son the finest robe there is. And do you know what the robe is a symbol for? It's a symbol of covering. It's a symbol of covering our shame, our sin. If you think about it, whenever we're baptized, or whenever the early converts were baptized, they would, they would line up and they, they would stripped off their old clothes and they would go into the pool and be emerged and rise again and put on a brand new robe, signifying their, their new life, their new identity, their new purity. And that's exactly what was happening here. He was showing that, that this young man was once again forgiven of of all of his wrongdoings, and he was covered by love and grace. And he said, put on his finger the, the ring. And the ring was something of great value and security. So to, to be, have the ring put on means that you are valued. We use rings today to signify, uh, for those of us who are married, of a covenant that is broken, that, that this ring says that my love for my spouse is so great and I, I value my spouse. And my wife can be 
secure, knowing of my love for her. And he said also, put on him the sandals. Now you see, not everybody wore sandals. Only people of great importance. Only the family members wore sandals. All others were barefoot. So for the servants to come and put sandals on the young man's feet was restoring this young man to a place of authority. So what the father was doing was saying that the young man was fully restored. He was fully in the family again. He was fully back home. Now today we aren't given the robes or the rings or the sandals to show this. Actually, God covers this with one thing, with the sacrament of baptism. You know, baptism is a sacrament. It, is a, it, is, it means that it is a mystery. It, it's, it's an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. And when we're baptized, it, it, it signifies to everybody that we are forgiven. That your sins have been washed away. That we have been adopted into God's family. We are no longer by ourselves. We're no longer out there on our own. We're part of God's family. We're back home. And it also is that outward and visible sign that we are part of God's great mission. We have been commissioned to, to carry on the love and the hope of Jesus Christ in the world. So you see, my friends, this story is our story. For there are times that we wander and we feel this sense of regret and we start back home and we're, 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 we feel like that we're not going to be accepted. But God runs to us and meets us in all of heaven rejoices. And God reminds us of our baptismal vows. That God has poured out his love for you. And God will always love you. And always accept you. And so, what I'm hoping that you'll do at some point today Maybe as you go to wash your hands uh, for lunch or dinner, let the water flow through your fingers for just a moment. Feel God's love flowing over your fingers and over your hands, washing away your sin. And then take your wet hands and put them to your head, your face. And remember God's great love for you. If he did this for this prodigal son, he'll do it for you and I, the prodigals of 2021. Let's pray. The gracious God, we thank you for this beautiful reminder that we are loved, that we are forgiven, that we're part of your family, that we will always be accepted into your family, even when those times have taken us away for, for our own pleasure or for our own whatever it is. You will always draw us back home. You will always wait for us, and you will always run to meet us. And God, we thank you for the gift of baptism and for a moment to just be refreshed as we feel the cool waters rushing over us, reminding us of your great love. And each and every time that we bathe, 
remind us that we are yours. And this we pray in the gracious name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now receive this, your benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance, His love, His grace upon you and give you peace. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And give you peace. And give you peace. And give you peace. The Lord make his face to shine upon you.